Hello and welcome to the Narsecast. The Narsecast is where we go through each movie made by Studio Ghibli in release order and we discuss our analysis and research findings. Today, as is so often the case, we are talking about a Miyazaki movie. But hold on. It's a different Miyazaki. That's right. It's the son of the man himself. It's Goro Miyazaki. So... Right off, the get, of, right off the bat, I have all the wonderful links I want you to check out. You can listen to our podcast on Lipsyn, narsikas.lipsyn.com. Uh, link in the description. Spotify, you find a Discord link to our Discord server. Patreon link if you want to support the uh, remained remaining cost that I'm covering every month for keeping this thing online and on all your favorite platforms. And of course, you can just download the episode as an MP3 file also in the description. Um... I forgot to mention the movie title. It is Tales of Earthsea, also known as Ghetto Senki, which I will say instead because Tales of Earth, Earthsea, you know, you can hear it already. It kind of messes with my pronunciation because I am just a humble German m- trying to make my way as an English second language speaker. With me today are my humble co hosts, co heads, and co sponsors and co creators of this here blessed podcast. We have uh, Hipster Cthulhu. Uh, that's not my true name. You have to sign up for the Patreon to find that one out. And Hipster Cthulhu, of course, goes by the pronouns. Oh, he, him. Yeah, sorry, I forgot that. Thank you. We have Platon Skull. Hi, uh, that's me, uh, and it's uh, he, him, uh, once again. And who- uh, un- 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 Unless I turn into a dragon. At that point, uh, I am gender neutral. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess we have never clarified the question of dragon pronouns. Uh, but uh, with us also is Voice Flower that you've already heard on the Hulse cast and is back with us to bless us. Hey, I'm she, her, and I'm happy to be here. And I thought you were Voice Flower. Yes, but you already introduced me. <laughs> no, yes. Is that the true name also? We're okay, and my true name, that. my true name is not Niat, but I will only give you my name Niat because it only gives you power in so far as you can find my YouTube channel and subscribe to me. That is the Probably power the that I grant power of all that. <laughs> yes. So, getting right into it. Tales of Earthsea released in 2006, directed by Goro Miyazaki. What a interesting development. So, of course, it is no surprise to anyone who is already familiar with the story of this film and, I guess, the story of Miyazaki's own son. But here we are. The great man, the legend, the myth himself, Hayao Miyazaki, actually managed to have a son. Isn't that stunning? Oh, God. Wow. (laughs) I'm very sorry. Though he himself admitted uh, kind of a neglectful... In fact, I think we went over that in the Totoro cast. Uh, yeah, yeah. Miyazaki's uh, relationship Miyazaki. with his family is quite estranged to them for the most part. Yeah, if we know anything about Miyazaki, it's uh, he loves planes, uh, he loves nature, and he is a workaholic. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so, so that's uh, been a like problem in the, in, in in his life. Uh, and uh, as you said, he he's uh, talked about it himself how he's like been neglectful, um, and. Uh, Generally, like the his relationship with uh, his son is a uh, pretty strained. Uh, although there's there's some place where speculation has to take over from uh, what we actually know about the production of, uh, of of the films and and people's lives. Although a lot of it was shared by Goro Miyazaki himself, who was writing a blog at the time of production, sharing some of the you know how it came about, his own feelings related to SC, and um, you know his comments on his father as well so one thing we can tell for sure and i guess we should tell the story in order is that goro miyazaki um was at the first not at all getting into the animation industry it is actually that he decided after high school to pursue a degree in landscaping uh and to work in that field instead it just so happened that through some back and forth through the you know, inner workings of the Ghibli company. Suzuki, at some point, got him to be uh, working on the Ghibli Museum and also to be the manager of the Ghibli Museum for a couple of years, even before this project came about. So Goro was not a stranger to the Ghibli Corporation uh, as we know it, but was already being sort of inoculated, sort of groomed, if you will, by Suzuki, who, of course, always the clever, scheming businessman, already had a plan for Goro, at least that's my read on the situation. 
Because oh, also another side yeah. thing I think is very important to mention um, is that Goro actually was interested in being an animator for a long time, but decided that he 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 literally said in I think one of the blogs or somewhere else in an interview that he just knew he could never surpass his father, like that Miyazaki being one of the greatest animators to ever live just hung over him so much that he just wanted to pursue a career completely like with nothing to do with animation. So he yeah. went to uh, agriculture. Yeah, I guess he became kind of lucid about this desire of his because like early in his life, as he accounts, like he has not thought about getting into animation really because I guess he kind of already had repressed it because mm. being the son of Hayao Miyazaki, fucking international master anime director legend is probably not easy. Yeah, and he, he did say he always kind of, uh, in like later interviews, once he started, you know, making movies, he's, he did say he did kind of like like getting back into this thing. Like it's always been a part of him that he kind of, I guess, yeah, suppressed in yeah. a lot of ways. Yeah, he's yeah. been but contending so with the yeah. shadow of his father, you know, not only <laughs> Very appropriate. the yeah. absence of his father, mm. but feeling the shadow of him. And shadows kind mm. of play an interesting thematic role in the, in yeah, the film. Yeah, yeah. W w w would you well say the shadow of his his father is uh, like m m might uh, come in a, in the form of a different clothed version of him walking uh, <laughs> suspiciously fast and uh, and looking at him while he drowns in a lake? Mm, maybe that might be reading too far into it. Yeah. But, uh, uh, but but yeah, the um, so yeah, the, there's a really interesting like uh, like real life story going on there with uh, with legacy and pressure. Um, but whether he uh, he turns into a Sofia Coppola is a, is a whole nother matter. Right. So yeah. So how did it come about that we got Goro to actually direct this film? So let's jump over a little bit to what is this film based on? So it's the what's the series called? Tales of Earth Sea, a uh, uh, book series, novel yeah. series. By... Uh, they usually just refer to like the as the Earth Sea cycle or just the Earth Sea books by uh, okay. Ursula K. Le Guin, very famous um, science fiction writer. Who were uh, I believe the, the the story goes just to briefly summarize it for everyone is that she usually writes science fiction, but then she was asked to kind of do more of a young adult fantasy kind of novel, and she says that wasn't really my deal. But then she she wrote the first book and she kind of liked the idea and can slowly over the over her career released more of the Earthsea books. Uh, and you know they they kind of the the movie itself borrows from about the first four in like weird little snippets by taking characters and moments from all of them and like rearranging them in a very odd way. So it's, it's, there's not really based on any one book. It's more a, a weird collage of their ideas. Right. Um, the, uh, which it, is kind of why the movie is kind of very structured, very weirdly and doesn't come off like a complete story. Cause it has a lot of elements that are just like not explained and just, you have to know the book to know what it means. Yeah, that's true though. I would say that those elements are, among the least important there's a lot of like sort of um you know hat tipping at details of the novels while not really commenting them commenting on them or or using them in any you know narrative way or or even thematic way but um, i also think it's it's such a weird series to adapt because it's a really good example of the young adult novels that really are meant to grow up with the audience yeah, because the first book is definitely more of a like a very you know young adult adventure with a kid you know becoming a wizard. He goes out into the world and he learns stuff. But then like some of the other books are much more weirdly structured and have much more like bleak themes. And in fact, the fourth book, Tehanu, which the movie borrows a lot from, straight up has a lot of like uh, talks about abuse and rape and like deep misogyny within society. And it's an extremely like feminist book with a lot of like very dark visions of the world as just a as a place so it's kind of like a, a very weird series of books to adapt particularly into more of a children's film that i think this was going for yeah and to yeah, get so. back into how this film you know came about when uh originally the idea for a ghibli film based on the earth sea cycle uh, came about by hayao miyazaki who was a fan of the books and had sent um, a request to Le Guin to gain permission to adapt them as early as the 80s, 1980s. And um, Le Guin, who didn't know about Miyazaki's uh, filmography and his work. Um, Which at that time wasn't really international and also was not right. very substantive. <laughs> Correct. She, she only 
could as- make the association of animation to Disney films, which she disliked, which was, um, and so she turned down his yeah. offer. Only later to watch uh, Miyazaki's films and and become a fan, like much later, like a couple decades later. Um, yeah, I believe it was Totoro that won her over. Someone showed her Totoro, and yeah. she commented on how the delicacy of the animation really did something for her. Yeah, and by that time, she had already uh, written three more books. At the time of of Miyazaki's original request, only the first three books had been written and released. So when she finally had seen Miyazaki's work and reached out to to uh, Ghibli to offer a, offer the um, permission to adapt them. Uh, she had already adapt. She had already written three more books, um, and so those three books, which kind of recontextualized the first three books in the series, um, had to be a part of the film uh, that uh, that Goro ended up uh, making. Um, when you say had to, do you mean that it was like part of the deal, or do you mean that like it, like it was too essential for the series at that point? Exactly, yeah, the latter. Um, that Tehanu really kind of um, subverts a lot of the themes of uh, of of this male ideal of heroism and patriarchy that is very um, common in. Western fantasy that ended up kind of, you know, uh, still defining the the narratives of the first three books in Le Guin's yeah. series. I think the way Le Guin said subversive. it was that uh, I think Le Guin said it like she was by accident sort of enacting this violence of reproducing this hierarchy onto her own fantasy world. And when she noticed, she was like, oh, you know. We- can't leave it like that. <laughs> yeah, uh, even if you don't read the books, I would highly recommend everyone read the uh, afterward for Tehanu, where Le Guin describes her entire like writing experience. Because there was a huge gap, almost I think it was almost like fifteen years or so between the Father Shaw and Tehanu, in which she said she really grew as a person, as an as an as a writer as well, and like that's why the book feels so much more mature and is like taking down a lot of the themes of the other earlier novels and really examining them. And it's like such a got a huge impact on the story that it's like kind of weird to leave it out almost. So yeah, we see so a lot of elements a, of it yeah. within this movie. So once again, we get to like like the, this tension of generational gaps. Like we have a uh, Goro Miyazaki and uh, and his father, uh, of course. Uh, th- then we have these uh, two books from the same saga that are like uh, ye- like more more than a decade, like a decade and a half apart. Yeah, at odds with um, each other that, too. That, that, with with the la- latter one, like. Uh, with, with a newer one, like kind of dealing with the legacy of the old, uh, in the same way a new generation uh, would, and then you have, of course, like the themes of the story itself, which, uh, like, it's pretty well established that it takes place in a in a world where, like, the old magics are like kind of fading away, and things aren't really as uh, as good as they they should be. Something's off. So before we really get into discussing thematics of the books versus the uh, versus the movie and so on, it is let us return to how we got Goro Miyazaki yeah. to helm the director's chair because when Ursula K. Le Guin reached out to Studio Ghibli, she was like, "I want Hayao Miyazaki to direct this movie." So I believe it was that um, Toshio Suzuki came to visit her, and also and they, Hayao Miyazaki. Um, at the same time, I. Yeah, they I have together. Don't, I don't have the according yeah, to it could her be letter. that he was there as well. So basically, the story went as follows: they went there, they talked to her, and we're like, "Okay, we want to take the movie, but we cannot have Hayao do it because he's busy doing Howl's Moving Castle, and also he wants to retire. So we have to give it to someone else." It took a bit until Suzuki basically first got Goro Miyazaki as a consultant on stuff. And then decided that Goro should be the one directing it. Much to the disagreement of Hayao, who was absolutely not uh, 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 in agreement with this idea, who was really against it, who was like, Goro does not have the experience, he has never worked with animation, he cannot just do this. And there was a, 
I suppose a somewhat big fight between them because during the entire production of Ghetto Senki, they did not talk to each other or basically exchanged just barely a few words with a very strained relationship. But Toshio Suzuki, always the crafty schemer, did actually get a Miyazaki onto the movie despite promising to Ursula K. Le Guin that Goro would only be able to helm the project under strong supervision by Hayao. Hayao did not end up supervising anything in this film and did not work at all on this film. She's like, I wanted Miyazaki on the movie. And it's like, she did not read the fine print, you know? She did not. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, 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 we have, uh, I want Miyazaki. We, we have Miyazaki at, at home. Uh, yeah, we have a yeah. Miyazaki. <laughs> <laughs> we have Miyazaki at home. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but another so interesting thing, thing about it, Legacy, yeah. there's two more things uh, about Legacy that factored into what has kind of influenced this, the, the, the production of this film and the inspiration to write this film. And those are really interesting. First of all, is another source material heavily used in the terms of design work and a lot of plot elements is the manga by Hayao Miyazaki called The Journey of Shuna, which by the way, is also where the uh, uh, riding animals from Mononoke Hima came from, if you yeah, remember. Yeah, Yakko is like the, uh, the principal animal in Journey of Show, which I would recommend. It's only like yeah, a it's... it's only like a volume long, and it's a very interesting little, kind of like a manga written like a fairy tale, very simple, but uh, but very interesting. And you can see actually a lot of the interesting um, moments of of that story. I can feel how Goro took inspiration, because it's a, it's a story... Miyazaki wanted to originally turn into a movie, but he felt it was kind of um, maybe a bit too slow and uneventful in a certain ways to be like a proper animated movie. Like he didn't think it would get made. So he made it into more of a simplistic manga. So it's interesting. I think it, Goro took a lot of clue, um, took a lot of cues in that and made this movie quite um, slower than you would expect for a lot of Ghibli stuff. Like not to get into it too much until we do, but you know, hmm. the movie's pacing is is quite strange and a lot more muted than you'd expect. I think that shows the inspiration a lot from it. So there's this part of the inspiration that while not on speaking terms with his father, he took his manga as big inspiration to transform parts of it into this movie. Um, he also took huge inspirations from his favorite anime movie, which is Isao Takahata's Horror's Prince of the Sun or Little Norse Prince. Uh, whichever title you prefer. And uh, it shows in some of the aspects that I guess some critics saw as like a huge, tremendous downgrade. For example, the character designs, I've read some negative reception of those. Um, but the like more simplistic legs and the stocky outfits and the more simple faces, those really call back this really old film from 1968, the first movie Takahara directed. Uh, really is called into memory here. So on the topic of generational conflict, Platon, as you mentioned, I think it is also in the uh, Rob Mel's Maslin article, which is really great, um, where he kind of posits the idea that to, you know, to, to make something you, new, you first got to go back in the past and reinvent the wheel, kind of. And yeah. that's so clearly what... Uh, that is okay. clearly what, what Goro was kind of doing here by taking all these very old inspirations and the old manga of his father and so on by mixing it with like these new properties with like the n generational conflict even in the Earth these Earth uh, series as it is divided. So by all means, like you can say whatever you want about the quality of the film and a couple of words on that will follow. But it is very ambitious on Goro's part to take such a weirdly metatextual movie to take on such a weirdly metatextual movie. And that's just, I guess, brave as a first Yeah, yeah this was definitely a very ambitious undertaking because Goro has stated he, he was a fan of the books as well. Like, he even wrote, read them in high school and, like, he identified quite closely with, with Ged as a character. So it's it, it feels a lot like how, um, interestingly, we saw Miyazaki take Howl's Moving Castle and reinterpret large elements of the story into his own view and how almost Goro tried something just as ambitious where he would recontextualize huge parts of this novel series into one new story as opposed to just maybe adapting the first book like most people would take, kind of a safe road option. Yeah, it's so, an interesting yeah. parallel between the way that Goro approached um, the sort of uh, his creative decisions have this meta narrative of addressing the past, you know, taking inspiration from old Takahata films, taking inspiration from the works of his uh, of his father, 
and also these books, which themselves, you know, uh, address this these the first trilogy um, in the latter books and and recontextualize them. And so there's this recontextualizing of the past in the approach to making the film and also in the text of the film. This And in himself, by the way, just to, as a quick addendum, like in this blog, he also details how he first identified with like young Ged and then later came to identify with like an older and wiser Ged. That himself, as a reader of these books, his approach to reading them has changed over the 20, 30 years uh, of his life between the readings yeah. of the books. But that's also another layer of recontextualizing and generational conflict I suppose yeah um, like at any rate I we've, I, I myself am, uh, and, and we're all probably going to be quite uh, critical of, uh, of of the film throughout this cast but like let, let's just get out of the way that we, we're going to be as charitable as, as we can uh, and also I like I do not envy the position that Goro Miyazaki was in yeah I guess uh, you, that's a good segue help, helming this yeah like helming this like uh, ad adaptation or like super ambitious a adaptation of uh, of this book series that had like morphed and changed so much uh, over the years and trying to put it into like one work uh, while having first of all no experience uh, writing movies directing uh, m movies or animating uh, and also having basically no help from his his father who was like the guy at the, at, at the company uh, he yeah. was working for at the time, which, which like all of that combined uh, and, and you s sort of like, uh, it's pretty easy to understand how the movie ended up uh, th the way it was, which if like, if, if we're being totally honest, um, it, it's, it's got that like, uh, like that, that annoying compromise level of an adaptation where the, like the, the readers of, uh, of the novel are like confused and disappointed, like uh, uh, like generally like comparing it unfavorably to uh, to the books, while the people who haven't read it are confused as to what's going on and are comparing um, it to Miyazaki's movies. Yeah, also that like yeah. that's a it, it's a hell of a position to be in. But but um, to be to be fair, like yeah. Goro was really doing a lot to make it work. He details in his blog at one point that to basically prove to the staff that he could pull it off, he did the entire storyboard by himself. He had never done a storyboard. He did it by himself. He showed it to them. Some of them gave him helpful advice. He could revise it and turn it into like a functioning storyboard, which he complete, which he did basically alone. And that's, I think, pretty good. His staff was also like then on board was like, okay, yeah, you showed you, 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 yes, let's do this. Let's make a movie out of this. This yeah. is, this is good. And he, he, he was really hard. motivated by the, um, by by the you know opposition oppositional voice of his father who was vehemently against him pursuing this and uh, you know sort of in a reverse psychology uh event or the uh that that made goro feel more motivated to make the film and to actually overcome the the shadow of his father lingering over him and, yeah. and, and just go for it. There is a concept by the literary critic Harold Bloom, which he terms the anxiety of influence. And there was an article, uh, uh, I'll also going to link from Bright Lights, uh, that was about this anxiety of influence and how it shows in this movie that uh, sort of being influenced by something, an artist finds themselves in a struggle. At one hand, it's like, yeah, influences shape everything we do in art. Like all of our art is building off of other art, but also the struggle to assert your own individuality against the influence. And how could we experience this crisis of influence, this anxiety of influence more directly than being literally the son of the biggest, most famous, most successful, most revered animation director of all times? That is quite the position to be thrown into. And I suppose this is another dimension of the generational struggle. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and, uh, and that uh, generational struggle immediately like becomes part of the, like the, the adaptation as like, uh, like the, the thing that happens right before the, the title of the film gets shown is 
a kid like our ostensible main character just like straight straight up uh, like shanks his uh his dad the king with no explanation and never yeah. is an explanation given in the movie which by the way i think is an interesting point but let's keep that oh sorry let's keep that discussion to the thematics part one thing i really want to get into is we've discussed now okay goro's working hard as it was a hard burden to bear let's talk about the reception so ghetto senki upon coming to cinemas in japan did reach number one at japanese box office and became the number four top grossing movie for japan in that year uh however it turned into quite the critical failure. So at first, the reception in Japan was mixed. Some ardent defenders of it, some voices strongly speaking out against it. But I think the biggest condemnation of all came from, I would almost say, like the parental figures of this movie. For one, his own father, who was very, let's say, savage <laughs> about his opinions on the movie. Not only famously walking out during the movie, to take a smoke break because the, he couldn't stand the glacial pace and commenting on it along the lines of, uh, uh, I think this is a quote, I was looking at my kid. He's not an adult yet. That is all. As crushing feedback as it gets. And of course, um, later on, Miyazaki, go, uh, uh, Hayao Miyazaki revised his opinion, I, I suppose, once they were more on speaking terms because they did indeed work closely together on From Up on Poppy Hill, which is Goro Miyazaki's next movie. Um, he basically revised his critique of the movie. It is an honest movie, therefore it is good. Now, it is honestly made. We can say that much. I do not yeah, feel the coming, enthusiasm. In, real, yeah. I do not feel the enthusiasm in Miyazaki's uh, Hayao Miyazaki's praise of this movie, but you know, at least he came around a little bit. But the other crushing piece of criticism, well, at first not as crushing, but Ursula K. Le Guin also didn't quite like the movie. At first, her criticism was polite, where when she watched the film first in a private screening, privately talked to Goro and was like, yeah, eh, it's not my book. It's your movie. It's a good movie. Basically saying that. But upon Goro releasing these thoughts publicly Le Guin seemed to have kind of taken offense to, to the fact that these words privately uttered were put online on displays so, so she released another statement which was more thought out and detailed more criticisms I believe we will return to her criticisms as we go along through the movie discussing yeah. it but there were quite a few of them and they were much less polite about it she took quite a few issues with the movie. So I, I believe the movie also like it was kind of panned by a lot of people and it got like was it like the worst movie of the year award? Yeah. Yeah, what a Rassi. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which I find I which I struggle to believe. I can't say I've seen every two thousand and six Japanese film, but I don't believe that this is the worst one of them all. Worst like, director I, and worst movie. Two awards from the Jap Japan Bunshun Raspberry Award, yeah. And yeah, and I think you're I, right, hipster. I I think that this movie it doesn't. It doesn't really uh, have the attributes that really would make it a worst movie of the year. You know, it's nothing egregious, but it's. Uh, I think it's that shadow of his father and of Studio Ghibli as a studio that is coloring the per public perception. Yeah, it really shows film. you what, like how this this thing was a. Uh, it was all about expectation. Like I uh, felt like the, like even even going to watch the movie for the first time. Uh, like I knew from just like general people talking about it in any kind of anime circles that it's like, oh, it's the really bad Ghibli movie that everyone hates. But going into it, I was honestly like surprised by how much of it I did enjoy and like how, how many elements of it I did find interesting. So I feel like the movie has so much like insane weight put upon its shoulders before anyone's even watched it. Yeah, not only yeah. for its association with Ghibli, um, but also uh, the... Earthsea books had been translated and in Japan for about 40 years at that point. So, um, oh, yeah, big fan audience. There's a little big fan audience, yeah. Just to kind of cap off the supposed production and reception, there's another big issue that kind of occurred, which kind of we should say 
um, made the reception more complicated. And it is that despite the movie being released in 2006 in Japan and being screened in, I think, 2007 in places like the UK and places around Europe, the North American release in cinemas was delayed until 2010. And that was because of licensing issues and whatnot, because another Earthsea uh, TV adaptation was being produced at the time, which kind of had some legal shit going on so that no dub and no um, release could be scheduled until 2010, which is quite the delay, like a four-year delay for a fucking new movie from now, like well-known Studio Ghibli, which I suppose American audiences at the time would be hotly anticipating, is rough. Okay. Yeah, like especially if like word of mouth had at that point already spread that like it, it was a disappointment. Yeah, you know, well, actually, um, it's funny you mentioned that because I recall, um, like eagerly awaiting the localization of that of that movie or, um, or the at least the the release in the U.S. Um, because I I had been a you know a, a Ghibli fan um, since I was like eight years old, so when when it came out. I was uh, just leaving middle school, I think, or in middle school, and when it when it, I I, I had to wait until um, my last year of high school for the movie to actually to arrive, and which which maybe colored my um, it set me up for even more disappointment. <laughs> my first viewing of the film, I was uh, I really did not like it. Did so, you end up catching it in cinemas then? I didn't catch it in... No, I didn't catch it in the cinema. No. All right. But you were part of the crowd just described. So that's another aspect, I suppose. You know, this movie is just one uh, one hell of a road trip of weird production failure. Yeah. Um, it's a shame because pretty good dub overall, though, I would say. Willem Dafoe is the bad guy. Great choice. Of course, Timothy Dalton... <laughs> Amazing as Ged, and even weirdly Cheech Marin as the uh, the lackey villain guy, which is an off pick. So uh, I listened to the dub today because I was rejudging the film uh, yesterday in Japanese, today in English. Um, Willem Dafoe does a great job, but I was struck by the decision to replace the original uh, uh, female voice actress with Willem Dafoe. War, uh, I mean, cop. that was already a very weird choice that I'm not sure exactly what they were going with there. Yeah, yeah, with with, uh, with the villain uh, cop, whom like I, I I watched the Japanese um, uh, version and like it came as a complete surprise to me once p- uh, people started referring to that character as as male. Yeah, um, t- to me, I, like, I, I don't want to. I don't know how much we're going to get into it because I don't actually think the movie has all that much to say. But like we said, like I said before, um, particularly Tehanu and the later Ertzi books have a very, very direct commentary on gender roles and the way that these play into society and stuff. So having a character who's like this evil, disgusting wizard who wants to corrupt humanity at its core and is also someone who's kind of like gender non-conforming and like a male character voiced by a female voice actress gives me a very strange vibe that I'm not exactly sure what message oh, yeah, I, uh, it's trying to send with such a choice. Like, I find it problematic. Um, yeah, I think it's a very so, weird uh, to do, and, <laughs> particularly with the Earthsea books of all it. things. Uh, we, can, we can get into it right now. I don't see why we wouldn't go into the thematic analysis. So I, I kind of agree that it's super weird that the villain, as the only queer-coded person in the entire work, is, uh, you know, that... Whereas the opposition, we understand, comes from this very, I, I would call it like this this family home on in a, in a rural countryside, right? We understand yeah, absolute that, trad core. Yes, we understand that Ged and, oh, I forgot her name. What is the farmer who, well, lady's name? Tanar. Tanar. Um, they are kind of like a parental figure, very traditionally positioned. Uh, when Ged and, and also Aaron work on the field, whereas she's like at home and just like, you know, doing all these chores around the house and taking care of the child, basically, which is Teru. And Teru, of course, um, is a much more complicated figure in this arrangement. But so far, we have like a really traditional gender roles coding versus the queer villain. There isn't, there isn't really much expanded on that. So the inclusion is merely puzzling and slightly concerning. 
It's also, and, it's not yeah. just slightly concerning. I think it's really directly um, just, it's, it's problematic because thematically, it's also one of the weakest areas of the film. Um, Le Guin said this in her criticism that in the film, evil has been com- comfortably externalized in a villain, the wizard, Kumo, or Cobb, who can simply be killed, thus solving all problems. And with this um, reading, it makes it even more disturbing that, um, you know, his subversive androgynous presentation is unfavorably paired with, you know, this insistence um, of, of his, you know, uh, you know, the, the the, yeah, the the desire villainy. of the you know the yeah. villainy exactly this this um his and, desire and like, to covet that, that, life indefinite indefinitely yeah like he's presented as like unnatural um and, and that like uh, easily becomes conflated with uh his uh, gender nonconformity exactly. on um, the other hand though we have yeah. Taru who has a lot of let's say transgressive and hybrid qualities about her. For one thing, we realize that she is not just human, but also a dragon. And the second thing is that we understand that during the climax of the film, she kind of takes away Aaron's role as the hero of the story by basically overtaking the final confrontation. And that is like the shift of agency where she, as a girl, receives and has in control, is in control of the agency over the boy who's like hero coded and throughout this entire film we spend most of the time kind of deconstructing Aaron's heroism and uh, uh, the the uh, Rob Maslin article does a great job of pointing out all the ways in which we deconstruct Aaron's heroism which we can probably expand upon a, a little bit later but for now I find it interesting that I cannot quite form a coherent image out of these seemingly contradicting notions right because yeah Teru, I think ultimately a... the, the dragons right we understand that dragons are not just like evil creatures or whatever like like a force of nature but they are like a part of humanity that was kind of repressed that enables her for uh, to to gain agency and be not traditionally you know submissive girl coded in a patriarchal society you know what i mean yeah i mean the the dragons as uh, stated by the the wizard that is um, uh, a, uh, a a I'm sorry an advisor to the king uh, of Enlad, uh, who's um, Arin's father at the beginning of the film. He, he gives a little bit of exposition about the history of Earthsea. As at one time the humans and the dragons were one, the humans go uh, chose the land and sea and material possessions and the um the dragons uh chose freedom in uh of of fire and air right so this, yeah. this idea of freedom right and which uh is exemplified in in Teru's, um you know subversion of these of these gender roles of uh of this patriarchal uh hero narrative and um her freedom is is gained by her her agency in spite of these structures and institutions. Yeah. Then I suppose it, it begs the question then, what about uh, 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 Cobb? When we have this distinction where Taru is a dragon and the dragons understood as being free of the social and societal structures of the humans and that this is their mode of being, then Cobb, we need to put him on the side of humans very much so. And then we would kind of have to make the argument that Cobb as being juxtaposed to the dragon's freedom and defeated by the dragon's freedom by the end is um, someone who is very much caught up in the structure of society. Well, I mean, yes. for one, there's this craving for power. And yeah. I would not just say power, but also sort of like a quantifiable capital of life. Yes. And I, I, I consciously use capital here because I feel like... Um, it's materialistic. Yeah, it is very materialistic and also like the movie makes sure that there's always this quote lingering in our mind that uh, uh, Teru says and Aaron also repeats and I think Ged says it as well. What, something along the lines. At least they all reiterate the theme of life isn't something you hoard. It is something you can only give. 
And that right. ultimately Cobb's great failure is the attempt to hoard life, to greedily insist on continuing living, ingesting, absorbing, stealing, extracting all the life of others wherever he can find it. In an in, in Maslin then argues that the only reason there's this androgyny is to be a shapeshifter to uh, accommodate everyone's desires and deceive them in a way, to be an actor, literally, who can act out any role required to gain. Um, I'm not yeah, sure think, if this, like... I think that's kind yeah. of a vague reading at best, though. Yeah, yeah. I, I, do, I, uh, I do think, though, yeah. that you did touch on something pretty interesting with the, the hoarding of life, because that definitely does tie into... Um, the, the, the most interesting quote from Cobb, I believe, is the one about where Ged is all about, um, you can't upset the balance of life than death, you know. But Cobb basically goes, the balance is already upset, upset, like man has already tilted it. And I think it's good, that, and it's interesting to note that it's like heavy parts of the early movie are all about like the slave trade that's like heavy in uh, Earthsea at the moment. And we see like many slave markets and a lot of people are being brought into slavery, which is, like we say, it's a, it's a hoarding of life. It's a taking of agency in people's, existence and like holding it as capital literally yeah i, th so and I think it's interesting that Cobb is meant are... to be more born out of that system and yeah. like an and, and, and result of it yeah, yeah we can it's... spell it out very straightforwardly here um i think for for all of those who are not familiar with ursula kaylee Gwynn, she herself has been her entire life a very very vocal activist left-wing uh novelist and also like explicitly identified as a social uh, uh libertarian socialist so the references to capital we're making here are not like on accident. We have a, and this, I guess, to talk about the movie setup, right? We are presented with a world that is kind of from inside crumbling. Magic is disappearing. It is being extracted. We have like a metaphor in, in one of the uh, narrations that it is kind of like the blood being drained. And one remarkable scene of this happens in Horde. Uh, uh, that's the town's name, right? Horde Village. Horde. Hot Town. Hot Town. Yes. And where there's a sorceress selling a, a woven fabric. And Ged and Aaron are walking up to her and Ged wants to buy a coat for uh, Aaron. And the sorceress basically tries to scam him. And then Ged asks, "Why you are a sorceress. Why are you selling like fake fabric? Why are you like trying to scam people here? And then she replies basically, well, you know, nobody believes in these stupid tricks anymore. People, you know, but people do believe that this, this scamming, scammed fabric, the fake fabric is, is right and thus they will pay for it. Magic right. is very clearly like symbolically being lost to this game of numbers, materialism, quantification, and this disenchantment of the objects of nature, of magic, of wonder, or whatnot, this alienation, I want to say, occurs very much through these economic means of extraction, of generating capital, generating wealth. We have slavery is another example that is very present, but all throughout the film, the early parts of the film, like we're just presented with a world that is slowly losing its magic and is becoming absorbed in greed and materialism and hoarding wealth. Yeah, oh my gosh, I just realized, but like, it's it's really a criticism of the concept that um, that in human civilization, we can have this ever-growing, eternal, um, eternally increasing economy. And um, I feel like Cobb's, uh, you know, desire, his, his goal is very um, indicative of indicative of this and but but at the core of it is that Cobb and also the people of Earthsea have bought into this lie that there can be constant material growth and gain um and never any um you know never any loss Yes, and this is, I guess, what it means that to hoard life versus to give life, right? If you hoard life, you're always just trying to get everything for yourself. And by that way, you will end up, at the very least, spiritually dead. Um, I just read a really amazing article. It's, this will sound like a bit of a tangent, but I think it's very relevant. A really decent article by Slavoj Žižek, who basically analyzed the Rammstein song. And talk <laughs> in this Rammstein song, yeah, yeah, it's it's getting good. Trust me. In this Rammstein song, it's called Dalai Lama. There's this motif oh, oh. of a father and a son riding an airplane, and the it is it's like a spin on Goethe's Erlkönig, a pope oh. poetically. 
which is like the wind is calling from outside and calling the sun, beckoning the sun, join us in the skies. And like there's a motif in the lyrics of humans should have never sought flight, should have never taken into the air. This is perverse. This is wrong. This is dangerous. And it is the fear of flight that makes the father clutch his son tightly. But the son does not die because of the turbulence of the airplane and the airplane sinking. The son dies because his father suffocates him trying to save him. Oh and I my. feel like this hoarding of life is like sort of an anxiety that life is being taken away from you. The question comes up, how do you even live in a world where you are dying, where everything is being extracted and we don't have community and we don't have like these bonds of protecting one another or keeping care of one another. And in this song, G.J. argues we have this crisis embodied because like the refrain, the chorus of the song contains the line, we have to live until we die. Um, how do you live? Zizek then concludes is the best example of how do you live is the healthcare workers and the medics right now fighting the pandemic because they are the ones that give life. And this is kind of like how it all ties together for me in this movie as well. You have an anxiety of death that leads people to kill each other, that to extract from each other, to ruin each other versus the yeah. ability to give life, to talk to one another, to live for one another, to live in a community. And this is a big motif in this movie as well. Absolutely. And get How do you live that... also the next Miyazaki movie <clears throat> coming out? Perfect. Hmm. I mean, it's, like it's, a, it's, a, it's a core thesis yeah. since uh, yeah. in Miyazaki's oeuvre as well. Like we talked in Mononoke Hime about Ikiru, right? Live. Sorry. The question of how does not come up there, but live. First of all, the world is fucked, but live. We need to live. Yeah. Right? Also, an, yeah. another another thing in which this movie kind of, like we're saying about the slave trade, heavily borrows from a tale of Shuna, the mm. Miyazaki manga, is there's literally a scene in that in which it turns out in order to get more wheat for like to, to eat and to feed the populace of this city, they literally just have this like weird, gross future alien thing that they just feed human slaves into and it produces basically fertilizer for their wheat. So it's like you have to literally feed human lives to this thing just yeah. to get the wheat. But then, of course, our main characters take some of the seeds and plant them for themselves and, you know, in their own small, tiny community, manage to actually grow wheat as opposed to needing to sacrifice human life for it. Yeah. So that's another the, clear little theme. The, the film can, also uh, in the text... Attaches. The film in the text has dialogue that really addresses this directly. Um specifically when Teru is, um, is, is trying to coax Arin uh, away from, from you know, his servitude to Cobb. Um, essentially, Arin has bought into the lie that Cobb has, has told about, uh, you know, gaining uh, life, hoarding life. And uh, when uh, Teru tries to convince him, she says, hey, you know, would you, you know, still the entire ocean just to be able to, you know, keep one wave from uh, from dissipating? And that's, uh, yeah, it really goes back to this idea that Nyard, you know, presented. I liked, I liked that, uh, that Zizek um, analysis of, of that song. Um, I, I particularly... Thought it was interesting that the father chokes the son, and Goro stated, you know, that specifically his um, he included that scene of patricide at the beginning of the film because, um, where while we can sort of you know project his own um, relationship with his father, there, I he he's explicitly stated that um, a reason for that choice is this disillusionment of the younger generation that the older generation has a stranglehold on them that they has has caused them to lose hope that there's even though there might be there might be economic prosperity just as in the film right um yep. there's not hope for the future there it's um it's a it's a lifeless world it's a world that is bleeding out its magic and, and i really agree with this read too because in my opinion, like the patricide is just, we, we start like the movie almost like this is like the second scene after an opening scroll. We start with a patricide that is, as we already addressed, ultimately 
meaningless, not explained, kind of out of nowhere. When when Aaron is asked about it, well, he's talking to Taro and he's like, I killed my father. And Taro's like, what, did he abuse you? And he's like, no, he was a great man. This is like the kind of world we're cast into. And this cannot be taken literally. It cannot be seen as this character had reasoning and motivation. And so now it's just like a symbolic extension of kind of the, the, the magic of the world falling apart. Um, Goro talked about this idea as well. That he was fascinated with that the kind of evil and the kind of conflicts that we carry with us come from inside. A uh, kind of co in conflict with Ursula K. Le Guin's criticism that the evil has been externalized in the movie. Goro insists that the like the split of Aaron into himself and this evil grinning Aaron, which is like which Maslin argues is a mask in a sense, in, in quotation marks, right. that kind of reveals the dark side of, 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 of Aaron. That is sort of the crisis we are dealing with here. Like a young person growing up in a world that seems so disillusioned and so falling apart and so bereft of like these great images that you can never muster up to, like the anxiety of influence, maybe even killing the father. It's just a symbolic incident of what the current generation is being left with. And I guess this is yeah. also how we feed into Aaron's arc and how it feeds into this like hoarding life versus giving life because we have this infamous scene with like Aaron's face being contorted in anger and him saying, life means nothing to me. And despite rescuing Taro, she's later quite angry with him because she says, I hate everyone who doesn't value life. So that's yeah. an interesting yeah. start of this and character it, arc, I suppose. Yeah, it, it, it gets into um, like w w one of the thematic points of, uh, of of the film, and also one of the uh, the criticisms that uh, Le Guin had uh, with the film is, is its uh, relationship to violence, um, where uh, we ha we have this main character who, uh, like li like we said earlier, um, uh, Goro Miyazaki is very in inspired by by these old uh, ad adventure uh, stories that. Uh, that the the elder Ghibli folks, uh, uh, you know, became famous for, where we have this traditional uh, hero who go who goes out on an adventure, rescues damsels, and uh, and you know uh, slays the baddie, um, and uh, yeah. and and, we, and in contrast, you have you have Aaron who, um, like he he does have all these uh, traits, but but they're all like it's all sad, like like it's it's all like his his violent tendency is. Like the very thing that's like uh, destroying destroying him inside and making him exactly um, de de uh, depressed, uh, like uh, lacking until, energy until the end. Yeah, exa exactly. And and it's it's a it's a way of life that like gets uh, directly challenged uh, by Teru, who um, like uh, near the film's uh, climax, uh, basically like at the climax of their character arc. So yeah. it's, it's like, uh, hey. You act. Uh, you actually like need to like pull out the the, the sword and, and do this thing, but but you you need to like, you need to like uh, get your shit together, you know. <laughs> to run um, through Maslin's yeah. argument just real quickly is like this. this yeah, this, yeah. This sort of. I, I think that that article is like goes really deep in, into this whole uh, dichotomy. I, th I think it's yeah. a very, I think it's it's a very charitable and uh, and interesting like analysis. Exactly. Um, so I recommend everyone read it because I think this article goes over so many details that we couldn't possibly account for them all in here. And yeah, so it's, many. It's, it's a big chunk of a text. So, but but just to recap, like a really important bit is that we need to understand what uh, 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 why I think why I maybe also have been convinced by Maslin and disagree with uh, Ursula K. Le Guin's criticism just a bit, like this externalizing of evil. So let's run through it. So Aaron is always trying to, in this aggressively faced way, very assertively do some things, acts of like saving others while disregarding his own life. So for example, the scene, scene where he tries to save Taru from the slavers um, that I already described, and Taru just contemptuously uh, reacts to this and says, your disregard for your own life is really dangerous and I don't like it. Um, later, Tanar is being protected by Aaron, but instead of allowing... Aaron to protect her, she thrusts herself in front of him, so kind of denying him the ability to save her by giving up his own life. And then there's the climactic confrontation between Aaron and Cobb, where, as I already explained earlier, we transform it into a confrontation between Taro and Cobb. So while, and this is Maslin's argument, while allowing Aaron to go through the motions of heroism, Goro never permits us to see him as a hero. And it is all cast in the shadow of his father's death at his own hands. So the reading then 
we could then argue, okay, so but evil is defeated by the end. We be- defeat Kumo slash Cobb. Uh, Kumo is just the Japanese name. Um, but here Maslin argues he's not killed by Aaron's magic sword. What kills him is that he sees Taru come back to life after being strangled, basically, in a form of the dragon. And then he begs her to give that life power to him. This, this like ability to come back. Hmm. So what destroys Cobb is his own craving for an artificial extens- extension of his earthly existence, quoting from Maslin here, rather than an act of violence on his enemy's part. And his death does not solve all problems, because Aaron must still return to Enlard and face trial for murder. The consequences are still there. So like kind of I kind of feel compelled by this reading to agree that the thing that destroyed Cobb came from inside Cobb. And the rift that is on display in Aaron and the kind of ways in which Aaron is denied heroism is also a conflict that comes from inside. Ursula like um, Kaleg uh, wins. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I've been no, talking. I, I just have a question with regards to yeah. that, that, that. Like it confused me because like how is um, like uh, h- how can we explain uh, Teru's you know resurrection and like having this like seemingly having this ability that uh, that, that Cobb uh, is, is is coveting like thematically what is what exactly is that saying um, and like like setting aside any like law explanations that that get expanded on in the books like well yeah what, i feel like that's, that's probably the biggest problem with this movie i would say and like it's one of these things that we clearly think and probably if i had to guess is probably Le Guin's big problem overall that she was trying to get at where uh basically to summarize uh the the the, the ending is taking very much after the ending of the the book uh Tehanu, in which at the end of that book an evil wizard has also captured ged and tanar is and is about to kill them and then uh, uh, through, you know, she comes over and she uh, turns out she could actually summon dragons like Ged could. And it's it's meant to be this um, this kind of juxtaposition where she's this tiny abused girl who turns out to have this unimaginable power. And the wizard couldn't have even imagined this because he's like such caught up in his own world and his own like um, kind of male power fantasy that he's living. And this dragon kind of this unimaginable power just kind of defeats him when he thought he was some sort of like all powerful um creator wizard uh, and it's meant to be yeah this juxtaposition about like the the male dynamic of the world and how they view the power and wizardry in the whole story and there's like so much background going on in the books to feed into this while in the movie yeah like tanar kind of just becomes a dragon i guess at the end, she kind of just through. is. She can kind of just comes back. For, yeah, through. She can kind of just come back from life, um, seemingly out of nowhere. And I the, don't think it's the, out of nowhere. It's 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 a bit out of nowhere because the movie doesn't like focus that much on her in the way that the book does, and like setting up this kind of no. But according to our recent, <clears throat> no, I think it does. Um, according to our reading, you know the um the uh, human society has become perverse and and corrupted because of its materialism and its 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 hoarding of life right but if you remember the wizard roots um exposition at the beginning of the film humans and dragons used to be one they used to be able to have a materialistic form of life but also freedom and expression right that yeah, I suppose and it, that is it, I, that I is married there. in the character those those ideals of and 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 that uh, value for life is present in Teru, which is which is yeah. why she's the one who holds the secret. And I, I I assume death death again is kind of symbolic here, right? Like Teru being strangled is not necessarily to be taken too literally. It is. Just that despite all of her abuse, she's of course abuse survivor, survivor, she manages to live and to value life. Against compared to Aaron, who for no particular reason we could discern, had come to disregard life so tremendously that he would not only kill his own father, but then flee and try to, you know, run away from everything, from society to hide, being yes. tempted into this drug addiction and so on. Whereas Teru, throughout all of it, despite being probably much worth off in every way than Aaron could ever be, um, 
to survive and to live, to insist on life. Yeah, and I, well, I, 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 li- I never noticed that. Like, uh, and that's mostly to do with the writing, which we'll get to later. Yeah, it is. Uh, <laughs> but them- thematically, that's true. But like dramatically, nope. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that. Well, later. I, uh, you were about to say something, uh, voice. Yeah. So I think that we can understand Teru this way by her with the juxt- by her juxtaposition to Aran, who, uh, again, as Nyard said, you know, has become disillusioned with the world and has essentially thrown away his own life. Um, he he kills his father simply out of uh, a malaise of, uh, you know, with living in a society in which he feels powerless and that life is meaningless. Um, and so he thus alters the course of his life and he, and he abandons his previous life. Um, I think Maslin really um, was, you know, keenly observed that the the shadow um, of Aran, the one that gives Teru his true name, is dressed in the same regal uh, clothing, embroidered clothing that uh, that Aran starts the movie out in, right? Which are his you know princely um, attire. So this is the this is the person that throughout the whole film. Aaron is running away from, right? He's running away from his himself. Yeah. And not a um not actually a a dark or evil version of himself, but simply a repressed version of himself that he then is is led to um he's possessed by 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 this darkness, this violence in moments where he most vehemently is struggling internally against accepting responsibility for his own life and and but he he doesn't want to do this because of his disillusionment right and he's running away but in the in the moment where teru accepts his um his true name i don't think that, that this is um like essentially it's Aaron's true self giving her the power over him uh, yeah, yeah, and, and revealing the like, secret. It's basically like, like a th- thematic turnabout. Like, like it's, it's, a, it's sort of a thematic twist it's going for where we kind of assume that this shadow, shadow, um, uh, shadow Aaron is, is like the source of, uh, of, of this violent version of him. Right. Um, the, the, this, this version of him that doesn't value life and that it, it's, it's trying to overtake him and he sees it in his nightmares and it, uh, seems to try to drown him at one point. Yeah, uh, and you're like, oh no, like like he he's troubled by 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 this inner demon, and like like I, I myself was like speculating on like, wait, is there going to be some twist where like it turns out the bad guy somehow put that like bad seed in him, and that what that's what led him to kill his father, but like it turns out with, with that that conversation between uh, uh, Shadow Aaron and uh, and Teru um, that Shadow Aaron is actually like. The Aaron that's more like connected with uh, with his feelings, connected with the world, yeah. and like the violence uh, in him was the Aaron we've been following all along. The one that's at that point being controlled by uh, by Cobb, right? And, and that's, that's important what? thematically because when Aaron gives his name to Cobb, um, yeah, it's it's forced out of him. It's for it's it's, yeah. and he's doing it out of out of still desperation to to not accept responsibility for his life. He's he's almost entering willingly into servitude yeah, to Cobb. Yeah. Being also, can I just say that that oh, might be yeah. the most unintentionally funny scene in like any of the Ghibli movies, where it's just like, he goes in, he's like, here, drink this. Don't worry, it's not poison. Oh, wait, it was very exactly. clearly poison. <laughs> like, well, that's important <laughs> no, because Cobb just, is I, I get what the scene was going for. I just found it to be just slightly silly that he just says, sure. don't worry, totally not poison. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I kind of agree that it's sort of Aaron is really on purpose going with it, and I think the the thing to look out for. I we now mentioned the mention uh, meaning of a true name. I suppose we should get into this a little bit more. So in this work, the true name is knowledge about a thing, right? The true knowledge of what, uh, the, an essence of the thing, and the, the the magicians, like the the weather mages, and all everyone else is controlling things by knowing the true name in a sort of way it is that you can be connected 
to what the true meaning of a a thing is rather than, you know, to experience it through, let's say, a materialistic lens, right? That is because Mm -hmm. to Aaron's name, his name Aaron, right, means thought. So it is sort of an interpretation of Aaron that is cast on him by those who call him Aaron, right? And including us, including his, his like, you know, family, and we have a strong association between him, him and his sword, his blade that he's always carrying with him. Well, it is his father's blade, and, yes, and right. like he is in a very like what would Freud say about this kind of way? He is unable to uh, to like draw it from a from from a tilt. He and even interestingly tells enough, Taru that he's not worthy to wield the sword. That exactly, he himself believes that. So, in in so many points, we see Aaron struggling to draw the sword, or rather fighting with the sheathed sword as it is. But what happens is that in a moment where he needs to protect people, Taru is calling out his true name, Lebanon, right? Which does not refer to a word for sword, but refers only to him. So therefore, he suddenly gains the ability to draw a sword, not because of some, and I guess that's Maslin's argument again, not through some like passing on of patriarchal power, but by having his true name be recognized by her, right? Through her, again, the life giving rather than the hoarding of life. I think there's a strong relationship there, which is also why, uh, to bring up a really important scene that we have have ignored so far, uh, Taru's song that she sings, where the movie takes a break to have a three minute long song segment. um, (laughs) Yeah, but with no backing music as well. It's just... uh... Yeah. And it's beautiful. It's probably the best scene of the yeah. film because she's just standing there looking at the sky, singing a heartfelt song, uh, expressing yeah. herself in a very direct and immediate way, in a way that makes Aaron just straight up cry. And he just, in that moment, sort of gains the ability, the fortitude to open up to her. That's right. And my sort of metaphorical interpretation of the scene in which uh, the, the the shadow Aaron, or rather the the internal um, true Aaron gives her his name. I see that as a, the, the, it's Teru's own realization of, of who uh, Aaron really is. And, um, and, and finally understanding his, you know, insecure, where his insecurities stem from, which is why she can, you know, convince him. He, she not only has, yeah, she, she, she has the true name and also she has the true, um, the, the true knowledge of how to live in the balance. And living in the balance is, I guess, the next point that I want to quickly go into, right? Because I think, uh, we have this imagery, which calls back Takahata movies tremendously, uh, of the farm life and the strong wizard, Ged, who is basically one of the only people who's still in touch with magic and who like does hasn't given it up, is achieved because he is kind of living in a way that sustains balance rather than disrupts it. And we see yeah. this embodied in the manual labor on the field. Why does a wizard toil in the fields like a farmer is a question I think Aaron asks. Well, why? Yeah, he kind of gets closer to the true meaning of the world to, you know, to balance in the wonderfully propagandistic Takahata way, where it's like, only yesterday, <laughs> look, the authentic, unalienated lifestyle is farming. Yeah, uh, That's exactly what we're getting here, because... Get some calluses on those fingers. Yep, bro. yep, yep, yep. There's like an idea of labor, not for profit, but for sustenance <laughs> in, in line with nature. And that is, yeah. I suppose, what the uh, balance is about here. Because another, th- another quote about balance that I found interesting is because someone was asking, wait, is this like a pestilence? No says Ged, because pestilence would be how the balance would restore itself. But the balance itself is under attack. By whom? By humans. Yeah, I was also actually, when he said that, I was like, hmm, uh, is, there, is there some, like, pseudo-Malthusian stuff that, like, oh, oh, you know. <laughs> no, I think it's just, like, <laughs> capitalism and place. alienation. Just, is, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's really, that's, in in a some, somewhat of a more critical um um, stance on it, I I kind of find that um, while I am I've, I'm I'm increasingly more convinced of uh, the the merits of the way that Goro uh, the the film tackles the themes, I also find that sometimes the themes come out in a um, in in a heavy handed way that is not supported by the 
by the by the drama. Yeah, yeah, and and like that's uh, yeah, like m- many people listening to this who who have seen uh, Tales of Earthsea and agree that it, it's it's the like, like the idea that it's like the bad Ghibli is is uh, maybe they're like like what 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 are, what are what what's this podcast talking about? This this thing is like d- deep and profound. Suddenly, um, well, I mean, it does have all of these themes, but I I would argue, and I, and I will argue that like it's not about them because it doesn't have like the dramatic uh, engine to be about anything. It's just a bunch of things that happen and a bunch of like themes that it espouses at us with uh sometimes with like flashy evocative imagery of a sword that can't be drawn and and, and lights up with magic and s- people turning into dragons and learning each other's true names and stuff but it doesn't really land at all yeah i, I think, think, uh, though, think which is pretty unfortunate i think we should think about goro as like a very visual director he likes to yes. think in all these metaphors and all these symbolisms and all these meanings and everything else seems extremely secondary or tertiary to him yeah, yeah sure, but in that, in that case, he, he he should have his character shut the hell up with the ex- right. constant exposition Dude. and start showing us. Instead. Dude, on a exactly. lighter note, like when fucking uh, Cobb and Ged had their first encounter, and I was and they were just spouting proper nouns at each other and hearkening back to past conflicts <laughs> that we have no knowledge of. I was tuning out so fucking hard because it was unbearable dialogue writing. Oh my god! No, no, it, 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 it's oh, it's no. worse than that. It's uh, it, it, they're like espousing like these vague and abstract ideals at each other that we as viewers have no connection to at all like like i, I cannot like find it in me watching this movie so to like give a crap about the stakes of whether or not Cobb achieves eternal mm. life what exactly does that mean yeah. for this world and yeah it's, it's well, also one of the things that never died the uh, there was a second writer for this was a Ke- uh, Keiko Niwa who w- yeah. would actually do screenplays for a lot of other Ghibli movies, uh, yeah. and probably a couple of ones to come after this actually. But yeah, it's it's no surprise that the scripting of this movie is probably the by far its weakest point. Like we said, Goro he storyboarded everything, and uh, perhaps like his his dad he, he then came up with the script after. So something like, that um, easily yeah. missed in the film that is actually part of the narrative, um, but it's so easy to miss. I think that it's heavily implied that um, that Cobb is, has hired his men, you know, Usagi or Hare, to, uh, to capture these slaves so that he can harvest life from them, right? Hair. Wow, that, that would have been a really cool concept that would have been really cool to see dramatized I know. maybe in a in a little action scene of it sorts would, it where would they have like have to rescue people. That would have been neat. So, but <sighs> I mean, you have to think about it because, well, Usagi is working for Cobb and Usagi is the one who captures um, Aaron and then Aaron ends up in this, you know, slave wagon on his way to somewhere we don't know. But then later on when Tenar is being brought to the dungeon of Cobb's castle, she passes by and notices uh, these emaciated, uh, you know, skeletons with bits of skin hanging off and hair. Um, And uh, to me, that's the implication that, yeah, all along, all of these slaves have been uh, bought simply for Cobb to harvest life from. But yeah, you're right. If it was dramatized, it would have been so much more effective and and connect the, the themes directly to the, to the narrative. Well, if we're going to talk about drama in like a general sense, I feel like that is like really the the linchpin when when talking about this movie um, in, yeah, in the like way the, it approaches it, its themes. Because I feel when it comes to the drama of the movie, it simultaneously wants to have a, a huge amount of downtime and quiet moments. And we we like we said we got almost like a half an hour section of just them like on the farm. In this very um, pastoral life that's like yeah. very calm. Well, well we, and very we also have that song Takahata. sequence. Yeah, the song, song sequence as well. Like just luxurious. Like yeah. just take, but then take a we, break. we also kind of get this like very seemingly kind of rushed ending where we have to fight the evil wizard with the magic sword and it all feels like it, it kind of rolls like onto itself very quickly with very little mm. stakes set up out of nowhere. So that's where I really feel the main tension of the problem is because, again, in wanting to adapt large portions of Tehanu, the fourth book, a book that is very much light on plot and very much literally about Tanar just living on her farm 
and like not a lot happens and it's very much about her inner emotional development and all of her problems uh which is like kind of got a lot of criticism from her audience for not being you know a big uh what you do a big a big story about wizards and crazy stuff going on but it's like much more of a mature slow story that i felt goro was trying to hint at but then kind of lapsed into also doing a big story where wizards have fights and like epic things happen you know i think so i think this movie yeah. is just really kind of caught between those two ideas and modes and doesn't really like um resolve yeah. this at all in a in an interesting we, we, way we, we, i'll it's have to say like it, pretty jarring there the, the middle of the film when it's all of a sudden this plotless meandering thing that's sort of going for this like slice of life thing in a fantasy world kind of vibe suddenly a plot happens and and like kidnappings and stakes and plans yep. and uh and uh, yeah and direct drama but like with no setup a- ahead of it it's it's a really uh, uh i mean so we we can yeah, do an that's, we, that's a lot. we can do an autopsy on like how the writing especially like sort yeah. of fails but first like the quiet time the I guess, beautiful moments, the sublime moments, I think all of those on a technical and artistic level are done ex- ex- uh, especially well. The, Absolutely. The music but, but before, in this film hang is... Hang on. But, yeah, before we get into that, I really need to go to the bathroom. Sorry. Oh, yeah, damn. Well, okay. <laughs> if I can say one thing about this movie, it is that those quiet, mo- quiet moments, the um, beautiful parts of it, the song, the music, the designs, the motion... The fields, the set designs, the city, the 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 fucking farm, everything looks and feels and sounds beautiful. Like, especially the background art, which is inspired by European paintings, as Goro disclosed in an interview, um, are striking. Like, they might be among my favorite backgrounds in Ghibli movies, just because they're slightly painterly. They're lo- like they're dif- different in style, and they depict these fantastic landscapes, like these deserts and ruins and all of this. It's almost like we're taking on an aesthetic that we hadn't even had an opportunity to explore in Ghibli since, like, Nausicaa, I guess. And those I really liked, as well as the music. The soundtrack is really well composed. This is a, not a Joe Hisaishi soundtrack. This is a Tamiya Terashima. Um, mm. And, you know, I, I, I know that in some episodes we like to point out the main background artist. On this one, I just looked at the credits of background artist and was like 15 people, and I'm like, okay, you gave 15 <laughs> yeah. different well, the, paintings. Well, uh, the main to art director people. is uh, Yoji uh, Takashige, who uh, is the background artist and like um, like lead art director for Mononoke and um, Arietti, which I feel like are probably the Ghibli movies with the strongest background art, in my opinion. Absolutely. So, yeah. uh, mm. Definitely someone who's worked on a lot of Ghibli stuff and like probably contributed to a lot of the great backgrounds. That makes a lot yeah, of like sense. S- something that really strikes me in uh, uh, in Earthsea is uh, the, like the clouds. Yes, I can, I can just like sunset. stare out at them and, and like the way like uh, the, the the film loves to like do like sunsets and sunrises, uh, which gives them like excuses to like do this really fantastically like vibrant uh, colors out there. And especially with the effects work uh, and parallax effects, like the moving. Oh, yeah the moving painted clouds uh, in the background right. uh, that, that appear from time to time. And so this movie certainly yeah. tremendously succeeds in bringing this world to life on a visual and uh, mu- musical level. Yeah, you, you, you better bet, like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to put uh, the uh, the background, background music on... Uh, uh, on, on my uh, Dungeons and Dragons campaign. Like, <laughs> nice. Th- this is going Fuck straight yeah. in the playlist. <laughs> yeah. Because and I think like, it's yeah, worth it's mentioning. gorgeous. In that it way. is gorgeous. I think it's worth mentioning that it's it's not just gorgeous for the sake of being gorgeous, but that Goro um, has detailed in his blog that his his choice to focus on sunsets is very much to do with the how with the way that he understands the sort of. Uh, the function of true names and of the f- the magic that is of Earthsea, which is to understanding the reality of a thing, right? And for him, it's the kind of question, oh, what is this object's true name? It's the same kind of question, he says, as why is the sunset so beautiful? And when, when he said that in his blog, I was like, ah, I see. Now I know why there's all these... Uh, you know, beautiful sunsets in the in the film is that it's really almost um, the magic of the world 
that yeah. Uh, and, yeah. is presented. Don't forget the dawn. Uh, yeah. that, that's a big one also. Also, like I, I, I read, read the world of Earthsea as like a liminal space in a sense because all, everything is transforming. The old magic is falling apart. Everything is changing. Everything is like getting alienating and foreign to the people. So an emphasis on like the twilight periods of the day that is quite uh, fitting, I think, for a world in which we can say the sun is setting for one era and into the next, which might not be as beautiful and nice as, as before. Yes. But, uh, but but like at the same time, it's it's really hard to connect with because it's it's hard to understand exactly what these characters are hearkening back to. Like, for, for, for instance, like what is, what exactly is the value of uh, of of this like uh, archmage um we, we get told repeatedly yeah. that it's oh it's the like highest title it, it it's the big shot and like okay so exactly what <laughs> does get get like do yeah like, this, what, what does it do Goro does not care about just li- live his life somewhere uh, uh, on a farm and like yeah. mind his own business when walking by like slave markets and Goro stuff. does not that... care about this really i think he's really just concerned about the idea of what magic is in this world. I, I kind of disagree yeah. with you though, because I think that um in the in the way that he's he's talked about his the making of his film, it's not that he didn't care about those aspects. It's that he, as somebody who grew up with the books and then reread them, he has this sort of uh in, you know, he he has the understanding, he 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 knows the associations, um, but he's not skilled enough as a writer to uh to create them, to create, you know, meaningful associations. Yeah, I mean, it in, could be in that. the work itself. But and so I, I kind of see it as a one, one of the failures of him in meeting his own vision for the film. It, it could, yeah, it could be that. I think. Um, oh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it could be that. But uh, what I was trying to kind of indicate is again the idea that he's a very visual focused director, so the concept and visuals are like kind of interwoven and the writing does not meet the standard to kind of facilitate this interwovenness i suppose i mean well, in, I, I, in I, that I, case i would i would be asking what specific image represents the the world that's disappearing oh the, um, the, the, we see the a lot world? of those like abandoned farms and stuff we see like literally like mm. dead kind of oceans like or the, that shot that was taken directly from tales of shuna where it's like all these boats in a desert like yeah. you know um and uh, of course all the slavery imagery is definitely meant to be kind of like this declining society and yeah, also of course like a world a, played on a world where magic worked is the world we are kind of being called into memory here but same with like the sorceress who had to give up her sorcery in order to sell fabric right like there was a world where these people were able to cast magic and this could change the flow of the world and the world was more in balance with nature the coding is pretty clear that the yeah, farmer yeah, lifestyle sure. is more what we are looking into here as but opposed visually, to the extractive no, but, capital yeah like, like but, but, but what i'm talking about isn't like uh oh these specific scenes uh with these visual uh ideas communicate this idea i'm, I'm thinking like like is, is there some like some image, some object that the characters can return to in order for us to understand that this is the conflict that's going on. And I don't think we have that. Okay. Um, uh, I think the uh, castle I, I would, serves that purpose. I would honestly say we don't have an image to return to because all things must die at some point. Okay, sure. We as humans um, just know that we're going to die yeah. and we experience our the, dying. Also, yeah. one side note, it might help you understand this bit more plain, but it's just, again, it's one of those things where the the adaptation is taking a lot of different parts where in the third book, Ged, like, magic is dying out, and Ged basically saves magic from dying out by giving up all of his own power. So then in the fourth book, he just, mm. like, has no power and becomes a farmer. While he's still called the Archmage, he doesn't actually do any magic because he's lost it all, and he's just resigned to being, like, a rural goat herder. So, I, but the, the book's kind of going back, and the movie's going back and forth between these two ideas. Yeah, is, so is, he, is he like a, a cool, strong mage, or is he like uh, yeah, a, a, a guy who had to retire? And it's like, what? Uh, he's, he's, it's really yeah. he's both. And honestly, oh, <laughs> yeah, he he's both. Like his his he he saves the world, not by hoarding life, but by giving it. Yeah, 
could have been cool to learn that 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 would add another Absolutely. layer to the film. Hey, I'm um, about but, ready I, I for you like, to take like to yeah. grit your teeth and get into the writing. That, that, that's the, yes, I'm, about, yes. I'm, I'm I'm kicking back. I'm here like Platon. You're gonna oh, yeah. tell okay. us all. I, I just I just, uh, just want to get <laughs> this out of the way before I, I forget because uh, we're talking about this whole like um, like I I think in the Miyazaki f- uh, film that deals with the same kinds of themes and they often do. Um, you have you have a character. Who is specifically representing this, um, like this pining back to uh, to better days, and you have this character pining for like getting rid of all that shit and uh, and doing some industrialization, and that's the conflict. It doesn't feel like it's really going on here. Uh, is is what I'm getting at. But yeah, so that out of the way uh Nyad, you described it earlier as an autopsy and that is what uh I, I want to do here because um i i this is not like a takedown i have like a great respect for the work that gets it's a miracle that any movie gets made let alone a good one um and i do not envy goro miyasaki for being in this position and doing this stuff and I wish the movie lived up to some of its gorgeous visuals and uh, and and the amazing score. It does not, however. I want to dissect this thing and figure out what killed it. And I believe that the answer is like very, very elementary. This movie does not like understand like it just does not contain basic storytelling, dramatic structure of any kind um there is uh, as mentioned before there's like basically no conflict up until like about the halfway point where it introduces a pretty arbitrary one but um like the core of it is like the very basic building blocks of storytelling uh, uh and, and the fact that those are missing like clearly indicates that yeah goro is new to this uh he does not have any experience um, because it's easy to like have all these ideas and want to express them, but if you don't understand the the work of it, then it, it gets out of hand really quickly. So it's it's simple things like, what does this specific character want? Why do they want it? How are they uh, trying to achieve it in this scene, in this uh, act, in this story? And um, and how does it conflict with uh, the obstacles in the way and other characters' uh, motivations? That simple question is really difficult to answer in most of the scenes uh, in the film. We have a main character who's like very like the inciting incidents of of him killing his father and leaving is left a complete mystery to us. We don't understand what motivated it and what is motivating him when we first um, meet him as the story like as as he meets uh, as, as Sparrowhawk uh, the the archmage. Um, at that point, like basically, we have a main character whose motivation is doesn't exist on purpose. Like his motivation is, he doesn't want anything. Uh, why? I don't know. It just just doesn't. And and we have this archmage who takes him under his wing. Why? What does the archmage want uh, from him specifically? Why is he rescuing him and not any other like given uh, stranger he comes along that, that comes along? Um, and. Yeah. The, and the the problem with that sort of writing is it it saps uh, it, it it no it, it seeps into every other part. It seeps into the in individual scenes, in which uh, you don't have a clear like idea of what the conflict is, what's moving this scene along, who wants something and who wants something else, and and how does that resolve, um, which results in a really lackluster pacing along with the uh, passive main characters who only ever react to things. Um, yes. Oh my and, God. The yeah, reacting. Yeah, w- w- which makes it really hard to sit down and engage and, and want the next scene to happen. And it feels much like slower than it actually is. Let, let's try um, to like go yeah. through like the start of the movie just a little bit. Right. We see, yeah. we see Aaron, <laughs> okay. Aaron kills his father. Okay. Cut forward. Oh, that, that happens like five minutes into the movie. Yeah, yeah, because the the, um, the opening is like a like a pre blurb where they're like the fantasy yeah. world setting up. I, yeah, I, yeah. First we have a pre blurb, then we have the the scene with the boat and and the two dragons fighting in the sky, and we're like, oh, my, there's a world with dragons. There's a world with magicians yes. who should know the names of things but don't. Oh wow! And then we get this this king, and we get a like a, a quick establishment of the of the these dynamics in the royal court with the queen and and the wizard that's advising and. All, so and, far, and all so these good. Ideas. <laughs> yeah, and then the 
dad gets killed for no discernible reason and none of it ever comes up again. Yes. Like none of the setup actually pays off because like it's not a setup. It's just exposition without uh, motivation, um, and- w- w- which makes makes it really... Uh, and, and then once we get to like, okay, uh, he, he meets Gab and uh, they go somewhere yeah, yeah. and there's no plot happening. From here, like, on out, from, <laughs> from here on out, it's literally just random events kind of happening to them, right? So Gad is just walking through the desert and he sees, oh, Aaron is fighting off wolves because wolves attacked him when he was walking. Uh, and then Gad goes to save him. Then they happen to travel together. Then they happen to rage hot. And then they uh, try to buy fabric for no discernible reason. We aren't even told why they're necessarily... Like, yeah, he yeah, says, no, he, he, he does say. He says and to then, hide, to hide yeah, yeah. the sword. Exactly. But, um, mm. like, not, not but, in a, but, not but, in a but, plot yeah, sense. Like, he says not, that. He not says even... that, but later... Hang on. He says that, but later on, when his sword is found by someone important, these guards... They just throw it away because ah, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, it's that, like, that, what? <laughs> that too. But like, we have no, necessarily not a sense of why they're traveling together. Ged was just like, hey, if you're just going anyway, why not come with me? And it's like, I, I guess. And then like, I guess Ged was just, you know, they were out in the town and b- b- dilly-dallying and Aaron was just happened uh, to be alone and run into slavers that were trying to rape a girl. And it's like, oh, fuck, I gotta intervene. And then, you know, the events just unfold from there. But everything is just like things happening around yeah. them and not them um, ever having the agency to actually you know drive the plot yeah um the uh, the south park creators um who I, I forget their names right now um i think was the parker trey parker oh here, here. Trey, trey parker, parker and Matt and Matt Stone. Stone, yeah, no. yeah they um they, they did this uh really uh well-known talk uh about like basic like screenwriting ones um where they what they called this was and then storytelling yeah basically if you have two like scenes you have two plot points next to each other and if the thing connecting them is an and then this happens you're in trouble what you need is this happens but then this happens therefore this happens therefore this other thing happens but then and so like that's how you you keep your scenes connected and like like it's it's a very 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 basic idea yeah. basically and it's a great diagnostic tool this movie is all and then story storytelling Absolutely. aside from like specific action sequences and then aaron does gets have some basic and uh, then aaron gets language. assaulted at night by the slavers and then aaron gets deported in a slave carriage and then he gets rescued and then they go to a farm and it's like what is happening yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and exactly. you know i feel like the, what what's really going on here is that if one is familiar with the books, all of the motivations for for the pieces being set in motion for these characters, their their trajectory, all of these motivations are um, are in the history of these characters, which is never given to us in the film, and which I think that yeah, I just think that Goro basically just didn't realize or just didn't know how to set those things up in a way that um you know wasn't yes, just yes, doing that, flashbacks constantly yeah, yeah that, i think that, the, that i thing, think one of the problems that comes okay. across with is that goro is very much trying to adapt uh the kind of style of the books but again like missing critical parts because we talk about this and then story which is i i would actually say kind of how most of the earth sea books actually are written like there is not a strong plot in each of the books other than maybe one or two things kind of important happening. It's very much the characters going and just having different things happen to them and them exploring different parts of their lives and of the world. And it's all very more free form and like uh Oh yeah, yeah, okay. I I And I, I feel I like the movie's that. definitely trying to go for something kind of like that, but without having the kind of strong foundational character writing that defines each of the books and like is what they're all about. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, that, that, that's a, a good point because it, it, it absolutely isn't obligatory, all this. It, it, it's not like a, a law of uh, of narratives. Uh, like we, we've, we've seen, like, for instance, Miyazaki completely forego any, any like, plots uh, in, in works like Totoro. Um, yeah. But, like, but, like, it has to be intentional. You has, have to get something out of it that you wouldn't otherwise. Um, it has to, like, be, be worth it. The trade-off has to be worth it. Because, but and and that's how 
Uh, and that's like the problem with this movie is, like we said earlier, it suddenly shifts gears into like, oh, actually, we want to have a an action climax uh, where where the baddie gets defeated and big reveals happen and uh, and character arcs are completed and stuff, um, which like like is pretty jarring again because it, it wants to have it both ways without really working and like diving down and making it work in in either yes, direction. Yes, so much of me wishes he would have taken much more after Takahata and gone for straight up just kind of like. Uh, like uh, a completely like no stakes plot and just having the characters move yeah. through the story. Leave the dark wizard out. Like, yeah, like yeah. Uh, like we'll, like what we see with only yesterday or uh, even yeah. kind of Gro- Grove of the Fireflies. The events kind of just like happen to the characters, and by the yeah, end, yeah, you, you, there's not, not much like, great like, resolution to an extent. Like it's kind yeah, of yeah, just, yeah exactly. If, 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 if I was there, like on the con- at the conceptual stage, I, I would be like, okay, either we like narrow this down and make an adventure movie with actual like like with clear stakes with character arcs with a conf- a direct conflict and stuff like that or we take that oh, okay we have a we have a retired archmage wizard who now oh, like labors at a farm that's interesting we could do a like melancholy um, meditative sort of film where he takes this youngster in and teaches him some lessons we can do that but like pick a lane please um, right the yeah, plot, but, but, like, the plot uh, elements but, of yeah, but voice you you mentioned something really salient earlier, um, which is like the whole thing w- where their backstories are like what actually explain their motivations. Right. Uh, and and that that actually gets to another problem um, with the movie, which is even when it has answers to these questions, like what do these characters want and why, um, like what motivates them, um, it obscures them. It keeps them vague. Uh, in 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 the case of uh, like uh, yeah, it, it, it keeps it vague and like almost like deliberately set up as a mystery with uh with Aaron with with the the his fucking regicide slash patricide combo, um at, at at the beginning, and and it's and we expect there to be like this late reveal that like why he did it and that will inform his character, but nope. No such thing happens. He's just like, I don't know why I did it, um, which is not very good for drama. And you have the um, like the the old archmage wizard, retired archmage wizard, who we have all the, all these uh, like dialogue telling us, oh, he was he was once this cool dude who did stuff, and it's kept deliberately like vague what exactly he he he's like motivated by uh, from moment to moment, uh, aside from these lofty ideas of balance. Right. Um, and these ideas, they're, yeah. they're often actually, one of the reasons why I ended up enjoying the film more on my rewatch was that in the between time I had read the books and these ideas about the balance and, and you know, the value of life are almost direct quotations of the Le Guin novels. And so there's definitely a lot of, you know, sort of uh, nods there, but it's tacked on. It's not woven into the narrative. Yeah. It's not true. It's not. It's not expressed through the characters' actions. And exactly. Be, be, because so many it can't express it. it. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it is unable to express uh, things through the characters' actions because it, there, there's no. There's been no thought really put into the motivations behind those those actions and what right. how those motivations uh, conflict with each other. Um, and like as, as I said earlier, like it seeps into other parts of uh, of the film. Like, uh, like, like the pacing, um, like the how how likable the characters are. Like, I, I did not really find myself really invested in Aaron. Honestly, I don't know. I don't know about talking about, about, about you car- characters that we don't like. I want to address yeah. Usagi or Hair. Oh, um, oh. yeah. Cheech this Marin, is one of the worst who I parts extremely of like, the writing. So I'm kind of Jesus. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He, he's he's really awful. I mean. He's um, a cringy schlock villain. Has nothing to do in this movie, honestly. But in, but here's the deal: is that um, uh, the interviewer at the at the film festival asks Goro specifically about this character, about this guy. He felt really sort of off. Um, can you? But can you tell me about his inclusion? What what led to his inclusion? And Goro's answer was simply that um, he felt that the movie would need some comedy elements. And that 
statement baffles me what? because he is not comedic at all. He's cruel, disgusting, coercive, and cowardly. And he's he delights in violence, especially sexual violence towards Teru. And it's just abhorrent, you know? And, and I think if there is a reason, if there's a direct um, m- m- sort of impression that led um, Le Guin to state to to uh, that that the film you know was violent gratuitously it's this hair. guy yeah it's this yeah, guy this dude absolutely well can i also comment on another character slash characters that i felt absolutely. had the absolutely. same exact same problem and almost worse than hair actually this actually really bothered me it's my second watch around I, I just kind of noticed it and it kind of made me really think about it um it's the two village women who come oh, yeah. to earth uh so Toru's house yeah see there's the thing they are clearly inspired by again um, characters who appear in the fourth book, fourth book Tehanu. But that entire book is setting up uh, the culture of the the village um, Thru lives in, and all the way that she's treated as an outsider, as a foreigner. All the way that she raises. Oh no, no, it's um, Tanar who raises Thru, and it's the it's so it eventually it, it gets very deep into the psychology of all the people living in this town and all the ways that these kind of systems have carried on for centuries and the way the abuse mm-hmm. cycles around but the movie of course has literally none of that and it so it just has these two people walk into scene be terrible people and then leave and they give nothing to the movie other than to say i guess people are shit you know, well, like not they, just they don't add anything. They don't tell us anything about about a lot of the stuff. Yeah, they're just kind of weirdly there to be obnoxious and like pessimistic in their existence. So yeah, not, it's, it's not just only a really that, weird inclusion that I feel like. Not only that, it, it kind of und- it kind of undermines the like like the the engagement with the story because if the story is about like saving the world, preventing it from really like falling apart, um, please like if you want that kind of story. Please don't give us as many characters as possible to despise. You know, <laughs> but you see, Clayton, please make that's, sure that, like, that's like exactly like, aside the point. From, yeah, aside from the core family, everyone is like terrible or enslaved. Because exactly. I, I would at least argue that Hair slash Usagi at least kind of serves a weird purpose, where he is the kind of coward that thrives in this world that uses up people. Like he catches people for slavery, he tricks people, he's a lech. He's kind of just a bad person in general, but he is allowed to exist because of the power institutions like Cobb's power gives him. You know, like yeah, he runs wanna... away at the end defeated because he, he knows Cobb is, is done for. So it kind of is yeah. meant to at least show how the systems at play in a larger sense are corrupt. But yeah, we get these two village women who are just like awful people and that's that's the moral of the story. Some people I are think just that fucking there's... unbelievable. Yeah, there's a, there's a clear... Um... When when we're interacting with these characterizations of these side characters, there is a clear discrepancy um, that is between the demographics of characters that are really toxic and and those that that are you know the the underdogs of society. And that is age. All of the characters that are adults that are in their middle ages are duplicitous and um, and selfish. You have the you know the sorceress who who's telling lies to her customers. You have the creepy guy who looks like the you know uh, the the monk from Mononoke Hime who is trying to get um, uh, Arin hooked on drugs, right? And then you have these toxic you know sort of uh, uh, busybody women who who betray uh, uh, Tanar who has given you know the medicine. You know it's all of these really corrupt selfish um aspects of society that is what the characters are supposed to save the world from right it's this toxicity but but yeah i agree dramatically garo buma is a slur don't use it (laughs) (laughs) but you know that's really the feeling that i get from it you know he himself used this used the term malaise um, about the you know the younger generation being choked by by the older generation and and feeling hopeless and it's because of the these attitudes that are uh, so baked into the the culture of the older generation and oh all of the all of the slaves 
are depicted as young people. There's even a character that he spies through the through the bars of one of these, you know, slaver uh, wagons, uh, in which he sees a, a a figure with their eyes, you know, obscured. That that has it looks very much like himself, right? It's this, hey, we are the young generation. We are being oppressed. We are being made into slaves for a society that serves these um, materialistic uh, ends that will only accelerate the destruction of our um, yeah. of our unity with 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 the with nature, you know. Yeah, uh, and then again, we we get back to this uh, this di- dichotomy of like thematically, that's absolutely true. Dramatically, it's absolutely not because it's that struggle is never like really dramatized. We never have a moment yeah. where um, where where like uh, uh, Aaron like like really like struggles with that like with that idea of of slaves or attempts to save anyone. Like we we they they basically. Uh, we we basically have a sparrowhawk just go like oh I unshackled them just let let's go <laughs> like he he does he doesn't seem to care about these people as aside from like oh yeah sure you're free um like he doesn't seem like outraged about it well, uh, says- and we don't have a single civi- like a single like quote unquote civilian character aside from the core group to like that we want specifically saved right if, if, like even just just introduce us to one sympathetic slave that sits alongside Aaron in that brief scene and you've and you've done it you've made it clear that there's something in this world worth saving oh aside God. from the natural cycle can, can we talk about the moment when 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 he when Aaron is like hey what's with them why are we not taking them and get is like oh they're unshackled they just have to leave on exactly. their own it's like wait what the fuck is this messaging right now what, yeah. wait, are they well, are they like too complacent or too stupid to realize that they could be free like uh, yeah, what? just like the just like the kids who are who are you know s- stoned out of their minds in the in the in the alleyway, right? There's a lot of contempt for the world in this movie. Yes, yeah, and and, and it makes like a, a lot of the like, oh, you got to save the world. Oh, you you, you got to find a reason to live. F- fall a bit short, you know, yeah. be, be, because of that. Like it's it it it, it gets into you. Like you, maybe you didn't notice it, notice it, but your brain did. Yes, um, and um. Uh, but, but yeah, and uh, as I said, said like this. Um, um, getting back to the issue of like core, like sto- storytelling, dramatic fundamentals, um, see, like sapping power from the movie and seeping mm-hmm. into all the all these other aspects. It's it it, it um it seeps into the like the directing, um, and like the art it, like like the artistry itself because when the characters don't have clear motivations or, or and there's no clear conflict in the scene, um. That means the director also lacks motivation, like, uh, like where the co- knowing where the conflict in the scene is, whose perspective uh, to favor, um, and, and and like what like what just what choices to make to communicate uh, characters' intentions and emotional states, get like less like clear the the less clear the dramatic conflict is, right. um, which means a lot of the the scenes are like functional but like flat and and without like like clear emotion and it also saps these yes. grand visuals of their power like 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 for, for instance what exactly does when they arrive to hot town what exactly does that arrival mean for the characters yeah at that point like 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 is this no, no answer the goal that uh that uh sparrowhawk has, has said is he at last returning to his home <laughs> Um, uh, or like, is it just another journey, and we have to focus on Aaron, who has never seen something like this or something? We don't know. It's just it's just a, a pretty visual, They're and you can you can you can add all the sunrises and sunsets behind characters hugging, as you want, <laughs> but that hug is not going to mean anything if it doesn't clearly like mean something to the characters and their development. And even further than like on the level of the direction and the artistry, the themes also. While they exist, when they're not dramatized, when they're not represented in characters in conflict with each other or with uh, with the world they live in, um, like and making dramatic choices and trade offs and uh, and like big decisions about it, we don't really get to get the benefits of having a movie about these themes, which is that you get like to see them play out instead of just yeah. having them 
told uh, like told to you by different characters uh, with it's it's not a like it it, it lacks like um it, it doesn't get communicated dramatically and at that point why are you even making a dramatic story uh, instead of like a poem or like uh like a, a painting about yeah. it you know yeah. you know he wanted to make this a music video set to her song that's it <laughs> i mean by like it's it's interesting that you talk about a poem or a painting because those are exactly what <laughs> Goro did. You know, he did all of the storyboards. Like he had the these ideas for these landscapes. Oh yeah, and you he know? wrote the lyrics to the song. And yeah. he wrote the lyrics to the song. Oh my god. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, it, it's a like it, it's a medium. He's simply like not uh, at this at this point like clearly like not comfortable with uh, working right. within. Yeah, he's just. Yeah, I think it's just very obvious. Like we said about the the scene with her singing over the uh, like the pastoral landscape is is easily the most striking and beautiful thing in the whole movie, and it's kind of clear that like like we even said, Goro is, is quoted in saying the the whole magic of Earthsea is in understanding something of like why is something beautiful like a sunset and like that more sublime and transcendental mm -hmm. like beauty that doesn't really work as a two hour film. But like, yeah. you're right. Maybe a music video would have been a really much better but project. It, it, for him it to might start have worked as a, have... it might have worked as as, as, as a, like a, a character thing. Uh, like mm -hmm. maybe like this is just just off, off the top of my head. Maybe have a scene in which um, Aaron like ignores a, a beautiful uh, the, the sunset and, and like leaves while others are, others are like looking at it or something. And 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 he, he just like doesn't want to have anything to do with it. And have like the, the, the sunrise uh, as he looks at it be like some sort of character moment where we, we dramatically see the change in him from like not valuing life and the beauty of it to valuing it by, by like uh, appreciating a, a, a sunrise or something. Yeah. M maybe something like that could have worked if, if you wanted to use that motif. Um, but in like, a dramatic way, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I almost forgot. Like this, for like, just to like, uh, to write it out as, as like directly as I can. Like, like how the like themes like don't work. This is a movie, like that's like textually very preoccupied with the idea of gaining eternal life, and with like the 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 value of like living for others, in which. The main characters never like deal with like like really grapple with uh, the idea of their own deaths. Yeah, like we never have a moment where any of them like reflect on a death in their family, even like or well, or, well, or, or, or mean... like believe, but like like or, or see like some sort of like uh, oh no, what would happen if I die. And we no, get that's told not true. There's the wolf scene. by, okay, yeah, like, like but that that sort of like again, that's that's uh, the lack of drama in, in the scene where it just feels like he can't pull out the sword, so he can't defend himself, and he gets up. So I mean, we yeah. we we, we of course like. uh, approaching this movie, we need to approach life and death as more of these symbolic things, as we've discussed in our thematic analysis. Yeah. So I don't know if it needs to be dramatized. So I'm not necessarily like, agreeing with this criticism in particular. Okay. Well, I, I just felt that, like, specifically, uh, uh, Cobb, like, spends a lot of time talking about how their motivation is that they do not want to die. And it's yeah, like, I suppose, okay, as we in earlier contrast said, to right, whom? it would have been yeah. nice to so see, like, the slave, it, yeah. the slave life ex extraction thing. I've, uh, that would have been nice to, like, kind of make yeah. that round. Yeah. Yeah, I, I was just looking for some, like, some contrast, some, like, relationship between the villain's motivations and the main character's motivations right. that that was that were yeah, like it, it's in just the one drama of those, and not just thematic and talk it, about yeah it. it's just one of those things where like all the characters seem to talk entirely in abstracts yes and yes, uh, exactly. there's no like concrete thing that we can really understand about like defining death because again it's one of those things where like obviously in the book we get so much time to delve into magic in a very prose heavy way that Le Guin can paint this whole like um, ethereal world of life and death and all this strange, bizarre imagery uh, and really get what the characters feel about it. But because we can't really do that in the runtime or with the kind of medium we're working with, we only get characters just back and forth talking. Like you said, Nard, you were you were really phasing out in that scene where Ged talks to Cobb 
yeah. and they kind of just talk about all this like kind of bullshit really <laughs> and it doesn't actually connect to anything like yeah, i guess i guess the, the like he does want to cheat death and you know that's bad but we don't really we're not made to understand how he would even cheat death in the, in the, in the most basic yeah. sense and we also don't have a dramatized moment where any of the main characters accept death mm. to contrast with uh, it. i i do kind of guess the moment with the with Tanar at the end where she kind of dies well, that's and the reborn opposite. briefly. She, she, yeah, does, she was... doesn't die. Yeah, it's kind of a strange choice. Yeah, and, which is why I pointed out, it out earlier because dramatically it, it just like, it, it's a it's a complete like, like a, 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 a balloon, just like the, the, the yeah. just air seeping out of a, of a dramatic balloon when like you set up this conflict between like the uh, having to accept death versus like wanting to like coveting eternal life so much that you uh you don't care if others die and that's like a, a classic you know fantasy idea um, or even sci-fi idea um that that can be directly dramatized with these like uh with this magic and then well it turns out the like one of the main characters just doesn't die <laughs> it's just they, they they get it they have eternal life already apparently or, or some sort of it like like they, they get resurrected and it's never like, and it's not like dramatically clear why they got resurrected, why that resurrection is like different from what the villain wants, and right. like, yeah, and, and and like how it ties into the main character's character arcs, yeah. which who have been like spending time talking about how you have to accept death in order to live, and then they don't accept the death of the girl. Like, c- come on! But but they do. Isn't but it obvious? Orin does accept his life right one of the things that i mean again it's uh, it's another case of what's being told and not shown right yeah but yeah. uh you know teru you know says hey the reason why you don't care about death is because you don't care about life you're you're and and by by not having regard for death that's the the same seed of that is why uh you know Cobb is trying to get eternal life and so Aaron's real arc is about accepting like his own place in the world and having to go back and face you know the consequences of his action um and so that's him accepting you know his life and not running away from it anymore, right? That his shadow is now the, the the sort of the true name is now part of him again. But again, yeah, it's it's not yeah. it's not dramatized effectively. Yeah, and but we don't have a dramatic reason to root for that outcome either. Yes. Like, like what 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 like dr- dramatically like he has a new family here. He has a new life. Yeah. It's like well, why go back? About. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We don't want him to go back because pursue like nothing interesting is back there. Like don't true. What are you talking about, dude? And, yeah. and 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 that also like the the problem with like how there's no motivation for him to kill his dad, which just like makes the whole idea of him getting back and getting redeemed like all the more like strange because like there's it's unclear what like he, he there's nothing really to repent for because dramatically he didn't make a decision about that like there wasn't a decision he made. It was it, yeah. it was a non decision of sorts because like there's no we never get explained why he actually did it so yeah. there's yeah what 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 would you say in court like his motivation was <laughs> he would seem like a complete fucking psychopath right <sighs> yeah also again like we said uh, with Le Guin's criticism of the violence and it, it's weird that like the magic sword ended up being totally necessary and he actually used it to. You know, try to kill uh, Cobb at the end. Well, so it wasn't he's... necessary because C- Cobb is defeated not by by the sword, but by um, by 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 Teru or Tehanu. And um, the sword, though, is simply the the visual indication that somehow some change has undergone in inside of Aran, that he's now able to wield the power that was his inheritance from his father, right? Which I, the only way to really read the the the, you know, the patricide is that. You know, in context of how the sword functions, 
uh, mechanically, his killing of his father was refusing to inherit the responsibilities that were supposed to be uh, placed upon him by his father, right? Um, yeah, but well, like there's there's also like some like watching it for the first time. I sat there like speculating what, why exactly he specifically picked up the sword. There must be something specifically important about the sword and the reason he he took it with him. Like, yeah. it has some like very specific like use in the plot, but it doesn't. It's just a sword that happens to be magical and lets him lob off uh, her arm. So like, yeah, it could have been anything. So this is this is one of the things that, um, if I can just address the books just a tiny yeah. bit because it has to do with the reception of the film and especially Le Guin's is that this is a detail that completely uh, dif- differs from from the books and one that was really criticized by the public reception of the people who were fans of the books is that in in the books in the farthest shore Arin is actually sent out by his father to seek out Ged to help him and assist in Ged's investigation about the disappearance of magic in the world and he is given the sword by his father as this you know signifier of his father's will and the Arin's arc in that film or rather in that book is about coming to terms about what it means to accept this responsibility, right? Whereas in the movie, the way the sword works is this is the father's power that is being stolen by the son um, by, by, by killing the father, but, but it can't be stolen. It has to be earned, which is why it's sealed in its sheath. Um, yeah, I think that's that's maybe what it's going for. If if I was to interpret it now, thinking thinking more on what you've said, actually, the the sword kind of functions as yeah, it's this it's this power and it's this will that he he kills his father, rejecting the the tradition and the the responsibility, and he kind of takes it for himself. He tries to take all the power and take the will and live like by himself, and like he runs away from all of his problems. And of course, you know his shadow uh, follows him the whole time. But then it's only he only gets the sword back because Tanar gives it to him, and Tanar gives him the whole deal about having to give life and live for others. And only then he can really accept the sword and the will, because he now realizes he has a role in the lives of other people, and that's how he can kind of open it and use the power. Yeah, so just, I feel like just, the movie well, kind of well, gets at, at, yeah. at the, the metaphor better there. But like, it would have been great to like display the build up to him killing his father and if 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 it if everything like the the character arc of your main character hinges on that exact conflict and you just don't set it up or explain it right i mean then you fucked up like simple as that yeah i agree i i think though that um you know we could play film doctor on this movie all day <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> because at the end of the day, you know, it has these ideas, but it doesn't present them narratively. There are so many different, you know, ways that it could have been, but the at the end of the day, uh, Goro didn't make those decisions, and it's most likely, understanding the meta of the film, he was just too inexperienced. He did not yeah, exactly. have he did not have mastery. Uh, over the tools of this craft and uh, and the film suffers for it. And I think that's a yeah. sort of beautiful a summary, a uh, good bottom line to the, what the core takeaway of this entire cast is. I personally think I've gained um, throughout watching the film three times in total and researching and talking about it here, I've gained a lot of appreciation for what Goro was attempting. I personally think I am sort of on almost on a wavelength with Goro in terms of the visual thinking and thinking and symbolism and metaphors. And I sort of see that coming through here and the limits of that approach and that style kind of maybe the listeners have noticed I've tuned kind of out for the writing part because that's usually not my forte. I'm not my strength. Um, and yeah. I like this bottom line of just having some understanding that Goro was inexperienced, was put into a very 
problematic, terrible position, had great ambitions, too great to sort of execute on. And that this leaves this film as a very interesting part of Ghibli's oeuvre, if not, um, it, it, even if it doesn't rank among the great or good movies in the Ghibli filmography. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I think it just goes to prove that, like, even with, like, the greatest artists and a, and a fantastic score and, uh, like, visually evocative ideas and the resources to meet your ambitions, if, uh, and, and, like, if, and great themes and a, and a great source material you, you have access to, to, to draw from, like, none of it will, will, like, ultimately matter as much as the, like, bare bones solid storytelling which mm. clearly like takes more uh like experience than uh that goro displays here i mean of course also yeah. you can do without the traditional approaches to storytelling but i Absol think we, we, we mentioned before but... like it requires some yeah. sort of I, I i always like the idea of you need to know the rules before breaking exactly. them and that's yes. i suppose where we end with this yeah. <laughs> entire movie. Yeah, yeah the, the movie was incredibly ambitious, uh, probably more so than it should have been. Uh, there's a lot of, again, yeah, there's a lot of really sublime moments that I feel this movie really captures what it was going for at points. And I've generally, I really appreciate at least what was being attempted. Uh, and yeah, like, I gotta say, just like uh, Miyazaki himself says, the movie was honestly made. You gotta give it that. And like, Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. as, as much to Goro's ability as he could he really tried to like capture something he, uh, yeah. he felt with the books and I feel like you can definitely see a lot of hints of it here and there yeah and with that I would say we could wrap this cast up unless any of you have a closing mm -hmm. remark to add uh, we forgot to mention how Cobb turns into 2D from Gorillas. Oh my fucking god! <laughs> I was yeah, I saw that as well. As well. Yeah, that's funny. That's a, like the that's exact a same one. eyes. It's it's so like it's it's uncanny. It's true. It's fucking true. All right, there was one more thing. Uh, I I don't actually think it's that fair to to levy as a criticism against the movie. It's probably more of a a general criticism. You could almost aim at movies in like a in like a much broader space. But it was just the thing I noticed. There was a big discretion, discretion. No, well, no, I was saying discretion between this and the adaptation of like the book, in which um, Tanar discrepancy. Discrepancy. That's what yeah. I mean. So, yeah, uh, Tanar in the book is it's very importantly described that she was severely abused as a child and burned, and she's described as having an insanely disfigured face and like the, like, I think the whole left side, terror, of, oh, the whole left side of her body is completely oh, burned. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Taru, and she has like a club hand with just a barely working thumb, and she's mm -hmm. like, it's described at many points in the story that you know she is like a very like bad to look at, and a lot of people like turn away from her. She's so kind of you know disfigured, and the book is really about the kind of love that you can give to a, a child even after they've gone through so much unbelievable amounts of trauma, and it's like a really like a really deep and mature message in the book that's like quite. Uh, quite emotionally affecting and then of course in the movie she just she has slightly mark. has a little bit of red on one side of her face she has a cool like, scar holy fuck yeah, that's like, so cool like, not even a scar. like I, even I know the, i know the, the movie essentially has an entirely different character for tanar she's much more like vocal Teru. and like gutsy at points and you know she's essentially a whole different character with the same name so I don't want to give too much criticism saying they did it wrong, but I'm just saying it's like that's such the Hollywood mainstream movie kind of thing to do where you have a, a character who's so purposely, like, ugly in a way that's thematically important, but then, of course, she's just a pretty girl with, like, a little, one little defect in, in the movie. Yeah, there's there was another issue. Oh, I have some background noise right now. Yeah, there was another issue thing? with uh, with the aesthetics of the film uh, that Le Guin had to point out because the, her conception of Earthsea was one that subverts uh, these uh, colorist, you know, racist um, institutions and attitudes. Uh, and um, by making tons of people thought, black and brown in the yeah, original. by making everybody from the civilized societies of Earthsea black and brown. And um, the the more uh, you know, third world, uh, uh, quote unquote, savage uh, 
societies are are the white people uh, from whom Tenar hails, but she was rescued by by Sparrowhawk, right? She was brought out of the um, the uncivilized land and into the civilized land, which is populated by the brown people. And this film, she thought, was uh, whitewashed. She's careful to say that she does not quite know how differently race is seen in Japan and that Japanese viewers have told her that they do see the skin colors at display in this film as more diverse than she does. And she was very careful about this. And to be fair, like, uh, we look at this film, we see we do see different shades of be beige and ochre. And there are different skin colors on display than usually there are in anime, but she was careful to indicate that maybe this is too whitewashed still. She would have liked to see more extreme diversity in skin color. Yeah. All right. With this, I feel like we've we've addressed the last point that was still in the room, and we can conclude this podcast here. So... To everyone in the audience, thanks for listening to the Narsecast. Uh, I will mention again, we have a Discord server, we have a Patreon, we have our podcast hosted everywhere. Go in the description box and click the subscribe button or whatever, you know, whatever you can do. Uh, like, comment, and subscribe. On YouTube, mm -hmm. like, comment, and subscribe. Um, comment. Comment, yeah, comment, absolutely. Tell us your true name in the comments so we can have power <laughs> over you to subscribe to us. D d yes, <laughs> debate with us. By the way, I will have your true name attached to your Patreon subscription, but don't be intimidated. I will not use it against you, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> next Ghibli, uh, next Ghibli cast, next Nausea cast will be on Iblad Jikan, which is a 30-minute short produced by the artist who was responsible for the background uh, a dreamscape fantasy artwork in uh, Wisp of the Heart. Uh, Naohisa Inoue is, is his name. And he directed, storyboarded, and created Iblad Jikan, which is like an exploration of this fantasy world of Iblad. Uh, it's a odd. It's an odd one. It's only half an hour long. It, we will have a little cast on it. Um, the we'll cast see. might be half an hour long, if that. Maybe, That's maybe. Until, you know. Yeah, but okay, we'll see. I appreciate a breather. We've had a good mm. run uh, uh, for a while now. A little breather again, and then Ponyo, which is a big one, of course. So I don't mind this at all. Um, this is what what's up next. So stay tuned for that. It's a really weird one for Ghibli, and you know. See y'all until next time when we talk about Ibla Jakan. Until then, uh, stay frosty. No, well, oh, that's a poor taste. Texas is frosty right now. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, no, don't stay frosty. Stay warm. Uh, learn to uh, give. Oh, learn to give life to others. Um, and yeah, bye. Yeah, bye. See you in the next one. <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> Stay frosty. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. It's okay. The, the, the crisis will have passed by the time you have this edited. Don't worry about it. True. True. Like, that's already like warming up today. That like a deadline to me. Quickly, get the cast out before everyone in Texas is already get, dead. Get the cast out before oh Ted Cruz is back in Texas. Okay, I'm, I'm stopping the recording here. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I've already.